for the past several days, the internet has been debating whether or not women should lower their standards and start dating more working class men like bus drivers following Ebony K. Williams going viral for saying that she would not in fact date a bus driver unless he owned said bus. I do want you to speak, Ayanla, to how women need to, uh, I don't know, position ourselves so that we can be in our divinity, so we can have our crowns right, how we can create and not build, when some of us, quite frankly, feel that the men that are available to us, and I'm talking about across the color spectrum, across the age spectrum, trust me, I've done them all, um, they are not positioned to protect nor provide because of some of the statistics we just talked about. They're not earning the incomes, they're not having the resources, and some of them are not even showing up in the leadership. Would you date a bus driver? You, would you date If he owns the bus. If he owns no. it, if he owns the bus. See, that's, a problem. that's a problem. That's a problem okay. because the standards and requisites, and I'm not talking about him laying on his sofa playing video games all day. <laughs> I'm not talking about mm -hmm. that. But the standards and the criteria that we use to measure men is off for who mm -hmm. we are as women and who they are in this society. I would date a bus driver mm -hmm. if he was, if he loved driving the bus, if he was a man of integrity, if he was good to his mama, if he treated me well. Now there's been a lot of back and forth. Some people agreeing with Ebony, some people vehemently disagreeing with Ebony. But I personally feel that this conversation has missed a lot of marks. And there's a lot that people are getting really wrong about this whole conversation. Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Ashley Viola and I make videos that focus on pop culture, social issues and current events. And today I want to talk to you all about this viral clip of Ebony K. Williams saying that she would not in fact date a bus driver. So for a little bit of background about Ebony K. Williams, Ebony K. Williams is a media personality. She's also an attorney and she was introduced to many of us, including me, through her being the very first black real house wife of New York City. But there's a lot of people who only now were introduced to Ebony due to this clip of her saying that she would not date a bus driver going viral. Now, ever since this clip blew up on the internet, Ebony has since done an episode of her podcast, kind of doubling down on her comments, as well as an appearance on The Breakfast Club, also doubling down and expanding upon her comments. And I want to unpack a lot of those comments today. Now, I feel like whenever something Thing like this especially when it's like a gendered debate goes viral and there's just a back and forth people feel the need to either staunchly be on one side or the other side like either ebony is wrong and she is a terrible person women need to lower their standards and date all kinds of men or the other side black women should keep their standards and ebony is right there ends up being this binary right and wrong which i disagree with because in real life, we know that not everything is black and white. Most things are not in fact black and white. It's multiple truths can be held all at once. I think that with the discourse that's been going on about this viral clip, there is no nuance. There's you're either one side or the other. There's one extreme or another extreme. And I think that there's a lot that needs to be unpacked. And I think that it's reductive to choose one side or the other. I think that we really need to have these conversations in a more nuanced way and that is what i hope to accomplish today so if that sounds like something that you're interested in then definitely keep on watching So the question that was posed to Ebony, right, was, would you date a bus driver? And her response was, yes, if he owns the bus. And Inyanla, whose name I'm going to continually butcher, I apologize for that in advance. I don't like to say people's names wrong, but Inyanla, Ayanla, the lady from the Fix My Life show, that girl, then responds by basically telling Ebony, well, see, this is the problem. This is why, you know, black women need to lower their standards because we need to be able to give everybody a chance kind of thing. My first immediate reaction to this line of questioning was, I think that we all understand that most people date people that they are in close proximity to. That is to say that somebody who is a lawyer or an 
attorney or someone who is probably a millionaire, the likelihood that they would frequent areas in which a bus driver would be present at, a working class person, regular, regular working class person would be present at, I think is unlikely. I think we all associate naturally we surround ourselves in environments of people that have similar socioeconomic standing to our own and we all date people based upon shared interests so my whole thing is i don't know if ebony is frequenting places as somebody who has you know taken on this black excellence which we're going to talk about that a lot extensively throughout this video but has taken on this black excellence kind of archetype i don't know that that she's frequenting areas that she would even be proximity to working class people. And that is why I take issue with the fact that Ebony is being used as an avatar for all black women because black women are not a monolith. You know, Ebony is actually the minority on an economic level compared to other black women who do not have the amount of wealth that she probably likely has. Right. And so Ebony does not represent large swaths of black women because I know for a fact a lot of black women would in fact date the bus driver or you know the butcher or whatever working class job that you could think of you know what I'm saying particularly black women most of them are in the working class socioeconomic level so I think just due to proximity that inevitably they would date people who work working class jobs. But in Ebony's case, when we're talking about a woman who is more than likely a millionaire, has acquired a certain amount of wealth, I do believe that there is a higher likelihood that Ebony or someone like Ebony, who is in a similar economic bracket, that there is a likelihood that if she were to date down, so to speak, that that there is a possibility that that man would grow resentful towards her for being higher earning and the inequities in the relationship could be hard to overcome. Because at the end of the day, a lot of different cultural barriers are difficult for some people to overcome. It's the reason why, you know, some people don't date outside their race. It's the reason why some people don't date outside of their economic bracket. It's because we're looking for people that can be compatible to us and where we currently are in our lives. There's a lot of black women who have dated down and women in, in general who are high earning black women who have dated down and have subsequently been clowned and made fun of for it. Think of Candy Burris from The Real Housewives of Atlanta and Todd Tucker. Those of you who watch the show know how much Todd was portrayed to be an opportunist, that he was just using her for a come up, how much Candy gets clowned for taking care of him and not having a man who is providing for her. Todd was always on the, he was always on the come up and I'm not mad at that. But you already know that when people say on the come up, you know that means you're getting with someone who has more money. But all I'm saying is, he always found himself in a better situation. Well, I do feel you're opportunist. What do you think I'm getting out of it? <laughs> what you getting out of it? When she introduced Candy to Todd, mm -hmm. I told her I could have choked her. But it ended up being good. They got married. Well, Candy took a lemon and made lemonade. <laughs> now, of course, Todd Tucker is no working class man. I'm sure he made a good amount of money, you know, when he first got with Candy. However, he was making significantly less than what Candy was making. I also think of Rihanna and ASAP Rocky, who ASAP Rocky, again, he is a wealthy man. It's not as though he is like poor by any means, but he certainly is not a billionaire comparatively to Rihanna. ASAP Rocky, who I am no fan of by any means, believe me, I'm not a fan, but Rihanna has been criticized for dating down. There's this constant discourse about ASAP Rocky and how she's emasculating him and not allowing him to dominate. There was that famous, I believe, Vogue magazine cover where he was in the background. And there was a lot of discourse on social media in which people were upset that ASAP was in the background and not being the dominant provider of a man. So it just seems a little hypocritical 
hypocritical that when there is a sector of black women that do date down, there is also a criticism that the man is not doing enough. He's not being a provider. So should black women be giving men who make significantly less than them a chance or should they not be giving them a chance? But again, I don't believe that Ebony K. Williams represents the masses of black women because I know that there are plenty of black women that would be happy to date men who in fact make less than them. There was also a story in the New York Times last year that went viral about a black woman who was dating this gentleman who insists that their first date be at Popeye's and she had to meet him in the parking lot of Popeye's and he was going to cancel on her like three times. And it was a struggle of all the way. And they ended up getting married. So again, a lot of black women put up with you know, all of the drama and things that some, sometimes ensue with dating down and end up walking down the aisle. The black woman had an MBA from Boston University and is the vice president for global inclusion, diversity and equity at a Boston financial services corporation. And she's also the president of the Boston chapter of the National Black MBA Association. The gentleman that she married, on the other hand, had an associate's degree in computer technology and went to a community college and was working in cybersecurity at a clothing retailer in Massachusetts. So yet another example of a black woman who was ready and willing to marry down. We know that black women are the highest educated amongst our population, right? So the likelihood of us dating a man and assuming it's a black man that we're talking about that makes less than us is highly likely. There is a segment of black women that will not date working class men, but that is because they've been indoctrinated with patriarchal beliefs that tell them that men are supposed to be providers, men are supposed to take care of them, men are supposed to be the heads of the household, right? We are all just inhabiting this patriarchal society. And a lot of us were indoctrinated by our elders who grew up very much in the generation that was before us that was even more, for lack of better term, up, okay? <laughs> I could not think of a really academic way to say that. I'm sorry. I apologize. That will be bleeped out. But I mean, sometimes you just got to drop an F-bomb to make your point. But, you know, a lot of us know that we were indoctrinated by our grandmothers, you know, by our mothers that told us, you got to marry a rich man. You got to marry a lawyer. You got to marry a doctor. You got to bring home, you know, especially within Caribbean African cultures, the way that that's indoctrinated into to us. So a lot of women, young girl, women and girls internalize that and that then manifests itself into our dating preferences. So it's like, don't hate the player, hate the game. I always say, if men are upset that women are working class men, that is, are not seeing them as viable dating partners because they do not earn enough money, your first conversation needs to be with the men. Y'all need to get yourselves together because when we think of patriarchal beliefs and we think of who has held the power for the last thousands of years and who has set this tone, it is in fact men. And it continues to be perpetuated by rap culture. And you hear these rappers constantly rapping about how much money they have, how many flashy cars they have, how many flashy diamond rings and, and chains they have and grills and all that. And so that is the expectation. These are some of the most powerful figures, if not the most powerful figures in the black community who are setting the tone for men and what they should and should not be doing. So this is why women are taking in these messages and they're like, no, I don't want no broke man. I want a man who can take care of me because of these reasons. It was not that long ago that a woman could not even so much as open a bank account on her own without having a male co-signer. In fact, it was not until the 1974 Equal Credit Opportunity Act was passed that women were able to now open bank accounts. So that was not that long ago. I wasn't alive in 1974, but I'm sure a lot of you were alive in 1974 and you remember. And if you yourself weren't alive, guess what your mama was, your grandmama was, and she told you, you gotta get you a man to take care of you because she internalized all that. They lived through all of that. And the women like Ayanla, Ayanla, whose name I cannot pronounce, I'm so sorry, 
Iyanla grew up in that generation and continued to internalize these patriarchal beliefs to this day. Women were also not even able to get business loans without a male co-signer until the 1988 Women Business Ownership Act was passed. Many people who lived through that are still alive to this day, and all of the politics of that still occur interpersonally when it comes to dating. And women are conditioned to want a man to take care of them. If you want a man to take care of you, you're a gold digger, you're a leech. If you don't want a man to take care of you, you're a man in a skirt. You're trying to act like men. You don't know how to be soft. It's, it's conflicting messaging from the same crowd. And so Ebony's preferences of who she wants to date and doesn't want to date, that's on her. That's all her business. I just wish that she would have just left it at that. Instead of digging herself deeper in a hole by kind of appointing herself as this like, I don't know, like a political spokesperson for black excellence and black economic stability ability. Following this viral clip with Inyanla, Ebony then decried that she was not going to ever settle for less and that, what is the phrase that she used, that word salad, that a lot of black people are falling victim to quote, what is it? The bigotry of low expectations. There was just a lot of words being used where it's like, I understand all these words separately, but together is giving word salad and that salad is spoiled, rotten and not edible. So out of the 50,000 plus comments posted on social, I only saw a handful that even considered the possibility of a bus owner being a more aspirational position and recognizing that I am actually speaking and pouring into the ascension of black men when I said what I said. But see, no, some of y'all were too busy naming and shaming me personally and black women in general as undesirable gold diggers and much worse. Now, I suspect that some of y'all are the same men that were bringing home C's and D's on your report cards, only to then be coddled by parents that said, well, that's okay, as long as you're doing your best. Well, listen, I love and believe in the excellence of black men. So no, my dear, C's and D's or any other form of mediocrity is not okay. No, I will not create a soft place for you or anybody that I love to fall comfortably into the bigotry of low expectations. So I'm going to say one more time, there's absolutely nothing wrong with driving a bus. My mother Gloria drove one for years. But could it be that black America has been sold a narrative of average, regular, and typical being good enough for us? Hmm. Well, see, that's called white supremacy. And in this case, it takes the form of conditioning black Americans to happily accept being a permanent American underclass. But see, because I know the truth about black folk in America, no, average is not and will never be good enough for me. And the gag is, I don't think it's good enough for you either. Yeah, there was a lot of things going on in this clip that I was just like, girl, you see, like I could see your point before. And if you would have just left it at, you know, these are my preferences. I am a high earning black woman. I like to date people who I have things in common with and that are also in the same, you know, space in their career and their lives. Could have just left it at that. But now the idea that we're shaming people who are getting uh, C's and D's and calling them average and the bigotry of low expectations is so classist, is so elitist, is also kind of ableist too. And I'll tell you why. Studies have found that you do your best in school when you have like breakfast every morning before you go to school because it helps to power your brain, get you ready for your school day. How many black parents don't have time because they're working that they do not have the mental capacity nor the actual time the capacity period to prepare a breakfast for their child how many kids are living in tumultuous family life situations that ultimately affect them academically and do not allow them to perform in school how many Black kids are neurodivergent or have other learning disabilities and are getting expelled and suspended from school for bad behavior and never even given a fair chance, you know, to actually learn in a way that makes sense to them. And it's, it's, it's holding, it's using these white capitalistic 
benchmarks in order to measure someone's worthiness that I'm seeing as a trend when it comes to Ebony and her talking points. People should not be measured by their ability to get straight A's in school, nor should they be measured by how much they can produce and how much they could work once they become adults and how many different jobs they can handle and how they can be entrepreneurs, which we'll get into later. It's just really problematic to put all of these burdens on the individual without a thorough analysis on the systems that we all have to inhabit of capitalism, of white supremacy, of all of the actual bigotry, not the bigotry of low expectations, because who even knows what that means? It's very much a, a strategy to, you know, have kids pull themselves up by their bootstraps and just go to school and get straight A's and, you know, become lawyers and become doctors or open your own private practice. I'm sure that's what Ebony would love for people to do. But it's like, how do elements in society prevent black children from excelling in school? And furthermore, this myth of meritocracy, all of the white children who grow up to have these really prestigious jobs and become wealthy. Oh yeah, I guess they must have all been getting straight A's in school. But did they get straight A's or were they Nepo babies? Did they get straight A's or did they have generational wealth that set them up for success regardless? We got to think deeper. And it's just a lot of individualistic, just blaming things on people who are victims of the system without enough critique of the system itself. I simply want to call Black America up to the excellence that I know we can occupy. I've seen it before. Entrepreneurship is the key to me. That's not just me talking. That's Earl Graves Sr., the, 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 the founder and visionary of black enterprise. I'm talking about black enterprise, black ownership and black liberation. And it is important to me. A, it's, it's in my DNA. It's my personal legacy because my mama told me, y'all, nobody will pay you what you will pay you. Mm. And this is not about shaming bus drivers. But I want to be clear. If you are driving a bus today and that is the maximum of your skill set, I love and appreciate it for you. I have to because it's an honest day's living. I am saying that it is not okay to bring C's and D's through the, to, to your home and then expect to go to, on to higher education and acquire a higher skill set. And when you say that, that is hurtful to people, Envy. I'm acknowledging the pain. But somebody has got to start telling the truth to our people. So in Ebony's interview with The Breakfast Club, Ebony doubles down and I guess expands on her thoughts and, you know, is explaining why she wants the black community to, you know, achieve their highest potential. And I will put that interview down in the description box for those of you who want to check it out. It was pretty insufferable. Warning there, I am not a fan of The Breakfast Club. I do not like to give them viewership. Let me tell you, I stay away from them very much so. But unfortunately, you know, I wanted to come correct. So I have to unfortunately sit through this interview in which DJ Envy, by the way, was being so dismissive, his body language, everything was very dismissive of Ebony. I did not agree with a lot of what Ebony was saying. However, as a host, you're having someone on your show, you need to show them respect, you need to allow them to speak. You cannot get overly emotional. You have to have a certain decor Forum, right? And you have to show that person respect. At the end of the day, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, you invited them on your show to share their perspectives. And so you have to allow them to do so. So when you come into it already in bad faith and already not wanting to listen to the person and really just wanting to air your frustrations out on them, that to me... I did not love. Ebony goes on to explain why she feels like the key to liberation is entrepreneurship. Boy, do I take issue with the assertion that capitalism is the route to liberation. Capitalism is not in fact the key to liberation. It is the cause of subjugation because the people who are at the top will continue to hoard wealth and very few black people will be able to break through and become multimillionaires. Even the very few that do ascend to such economic stability hoard the wealth and keep the black poor folks poor and the black working class folks 
in the working class. That is literally capitalism 101. Everybody cannot have their fair share. Everybody can't be an entrepreneur, especially when so much of this world, this society that we live in requires us to participate in the nine to five matrix. For example, so many people's healthcare is wrapped up in their nine to five job. So many people's child and family leave care is wrapped up in their nine to five jobs. So many people's retirement plans are wrapped up in their nine to five jobs. So it's simply not accessible for everyone to be an entrepreneur. So many people need the predictability that comes with having a nine to five job because it is a steady amount of money that you're consistently getting paid versus being an entrepreneur where you're lucky if you even break even, but mostly you spend many years not breaking even and being in the red. And that is the reality. And so being an entrepreneur is not all that it's cracked up to be. As someone who is an entrepreneur herself, balancing a nine to five job on top of starting your own business is extremely difficult to do. Using these capitalist metrics and benchmarks and tactics is not the way to escape oppression and to achieve liberation. The way to do that is to abolish these metrics altogether and to level the playing field. All this talk of ownership and, and you know home ownership and multiple streams of income and all of that Without a discourse about the prevalence of black people getting denied disproportionately for home equity loans, redlining and all of the systemic practices that are at play that prevent black folks from being homeowners. Why are we not having conversations about that? Why are we putting all of the onus on the black person to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get to work, start your business, own a home? Well, you can't do that when there's all of these barriers in place so easily. I think one of the most significant examples of this ideology of black capitalism being a failure is the infamous Black Wall Street burnings, which happened in 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where white mobs attacked black residents and took their lives and destroyed their homes and their businesses that they had worked so hard on building. I think this is an important reminder that black capitalism will absolutely not save us because those in power will always seek to keep and maintain systems of oppression that keep them in power. Even though I have a goal of being an entrepreneur, I don't think that everybody should be an entrepreneur. I recognize the toll that it takes on so many people. The idea that black people are supposed to conform to these capitalistic benchmarks of success that were made to exclude us is so irresponsible to me, especially considering in the Real Housewives of New York, Ebony was consistently iced out. She was consistently subjected to microaggressions by this all white cast that she was surrounded by, so much so that they had to cancel the whole franchise. The Real Housewives of New York City has not aired since like 2020. It is now 2023 because the discrimination was so bad that the network did not want to have to answer to the bad behavior that occurred in this season, the very racist behavior. So they just scrapped the show altogether. Her cast members formed like an alliance to not film with her and basically iced her out of the cast, okay? So this is what happens. This is what happens. The individual cannot be disruptive of the systems that are at play. The real reason that a lot of black women are not able to find relationships is because we are so dehumanized because of colorism, because of texturism, because of just black women being positioned in society as being less than desirable by many. And when we're not talking about that and we're leaving the conversation, Ah, well, you just need to lower your standards or bigotry of low expectations. Well, you just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. These things are complicated. We need to be thinking that there's multiple truths that can be held all at once. And we need to accept that because this world, this life is not black and white. And if you live long enough, you know that there is good with bad. There is neutral in there. There's everything wrapped up into the existence and our humanity and to reduce it to how much money we make, our abilities to produce, 
our grades that we get in school have to lower your standards. We need to talk about things from all angles and all sides. And I really hope that I was successful in doing that today. I feel that I have been super comprehensive. I've been filming for so long, <laughs> but I definitely wanna hear from you all. I know I've talked quite a bit today, so I would love to stop talking and allow you guys to start talking. I'll pass the microphone to you, if you will. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear from you all in the comments down below. How do you feel about this whole bus driver uh, discourse? Uh, do you agree? Do you disagree? All thoughts are welcome as long as they're done in respect. If they're not done in respect, you will get blocked. So have respect for one another and respectfully agree or disagree. And uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thank you all so, so much for watching and I'll talk to you all next time.